had the opportunity to visit Robert Ridgely in his home office in the woods of New Hampshire in December 2019. Robert really knows his birds. He literally wrote the book on the birds of South America, Panama, Ecuador, and now Brazil. Robert uses a multi-level, diverse approach towards wildlife conservation, which has resulted in an impressive sum of successful achievements. Hi, welcome to Ground Truth Conservation. I'm Bennett Hennessy, and I'm here with Bob Ridgely, and who has 20 years now in, with conservation experience, and we're going to be talking about his movements to, towards conservation, opinions on conservation, what's happening in the world, how things are going. So maybe you could start telling me what triggered you to move from academia more towards conservation? Well, I, <clears throat> my career started in Latin America. Actually, my, my, I started as a bird watcher, a very serious bird watcher as a, as, a, as a boy, very, very young, very, very young age, four or five years old, I'm told. Um, and so I carried that through, through high school and in, even into college. But in those days, this is a long time ago now, in the 1960s, there was no way to make a career out of that. And so I was lucky in that I, I was sent by the U.S. Army to the Panama Canal Zone. And that was the eye-opener and the opportunity that, I, that, 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 that suddenly was there before me, that I didn't need to be a history major that didn't really, and then become a lawyer the way I sort of thought I would, mm -hmm. that I didn't need to follow that career track, that I could do, maybe do something with birds and maybe do something in conservation. I wasn't thinking about conservation then. There wasn't much conservation directly being done then. There wasn't as much, nor as near as many opportunities. Uh, and, and he ended up pursuing ornithology. It was kind of a miracle that I was able to do it, but I did end up going to the School of Forestry at Yale University and got a position at the Academy of Natural Sciences. And that, that was about in, two, that was in 1981. And I had a little over 20 wonder, wonderful years there doing research in Latin America with a special focus on the Andes, Andean birds, and but I ended up being interested in the neotropical avifauna more generally. And anybody who spends time studying the birds there quickly know, quickly learns that you need there is a, a tremendous need for conservation activities. And I love doing my research. I was at the vanguard in many ways with tape recording and a lot of other a lot of other things, but. I gradually became convinced that my real calling was to jump into conservation full time. And I was given the opportunity at National Audubon Society to do that, and then ABC, and more recently I've been with Rainforest Trust, where I'm now the president. Right. How long have you been with Rainforest Trust? Rainforest Trust, that was with my old friend Byron Swift, and he pulled me out of ABC, actually, American Bird Conservancy, uh, a wonderful group that we work with now extensively, but I was encouraged to go over to with Byron uh, back in when the, during the, the birthing years of Rainforest Trust. I've been working with Bennett the entire time, pretty much, pretty yeah. much those in full 20 years. All those 20 years, yeah. 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 So I do love to see what you and I have managed to pull off, and you've been on, you've been on both ends of it now too, and continue to be, this cooperation uh, on the non-governmental side in so-called first world and so-called third world, the cooperation between groups in our, in our case in North America down into, down into Latin America. I think the cooperation there is proving to be, I, I think, solid, and I, I like to think that that model is going to continue to work. So that's, and of course that, that didn't exist at all. 25 or 30 years ago. That, that this, is, this is brand new stuff. And groups like ABC and, and others that are directly involved in supporting nonprofits in Latin America. That's one of, the, one of the joys of being involved with the Rainforest Trust is that it's, Rainforest Trust is not just bird oriented. That I'm now learning about and having an effect on uh, tropical Africa and tropical Asia as well, as well as tropical America, and on species that are in desperate need of attention.
attention and help in, in Asia and Africa as well as in Latin America. How do you perceive the future of wildlife conservation? That's a tough question. It's a hard one to answer. Someone of my age with the amount and the number of years that I've had in the field doing various projects and having achieved certain successes and have weakness and some failures or some that just didn't succeed quite the way we expected. I have to admit, kind of in this year, 2019, things have certainly seemed to take a turn for the worse. I, I, I'm going to have to throw it a little bit into the whole climate change issue because I think that has, that does have a bearing on what Bennett and I have been particularly interested in all, all these 20 years, which has been species protection in Latin America. Um, but that's having, climate change is starting to have an effect there. And uh, we're all beginning to recognize that. And it does look like climate change is here to stay, whether we want to admit it or uh, want to accept it or not. We're, all of us need to do what we can to, uh, in a personal and a more general way, to prevent that from getting any worse. But I'm afraid the trajectory isn't good. I am pleased to say, though, that we do seem to have pretty much held, held off extinctions in Latin America for, the last, for these 20 or 25 years. There haven't been many, not as many as people were predicting a quarter century ago. <clears throat> Everyone thought there'd be all kinds of ex extinctions in the Amazon and in eastern Brazil and so forth, and there have been a few, but not many. And uh, of course, uh, with increased information now, targeted information we have on most, most of the critically rare species out there, we can do, we can solve a lot of them with enough money and enough will and good organizations to work with and good governments to work with. Unfortunately, that's not the case everywhere, of course. Mm -hmm. no. But we're doing our best. I, I have tended to particularly push the idea of private NGOs, non-governmental organizations, working with Latin Americans in, in the various countries. And I particularly had a focus on Ecuador, as all my colleagues know, but I've also had quite a bit of involvement with in various other countries like Panama and Colombia and Peru, and, uh, and even now a little bit in Bolivia too. Uh, and I love all the countries. I don't really have a favorite. I guess I'd have to say it probably was Ecuador, but, but to be honest, I, I, I love Latin America. That's, where I, well, that's what I really love. It is a little disheartening because we do seem perhaps maybe not on the species protection level, but in general, we seem to be losing ground now. And the problems sort of are, seem to be overwhelming. The fires in the Amazon, the fires in Eastern Bolivia, the, the difficulties we're having in Ecuador with oil exploration in the East. And, and uh, it's just, there's a series of things that are going on now that we almost seem powerless to stop. But that doesn't mean we won't try, of course. One of, the, one of the things that's changed the most dramatically and is a real, po in a positive direction, exceedingly positive direction, is the interest in Lat on the part of Latin Americans in what we're talking about. That has been a sea change, a, a genuine sea change. When I first started going to Panama and Ecuador or other countries, pretty, I was pretty much alone. There were a few scientists who were doing, who were working at one, one, one or another pro project or so, doing a directed research, but there was no interest on the part of the general population. And now there is. Mm. Now that's, that, is, that is really starting to happen in everywhere, from Brazil all the way up to Mexico and every country in between. That, is, that has been a dramatic change, and that does give one a little cause for hope. So uh, sort of on that thing, how do you feel about the conflict in the conservation world between attention going to climate change and not so much to species conservation? They're obviously tied together. I guess I don't see it as a conflict. I think a lot of people, a lot of people's connection to the natural world comes from 
being exposed to species and to situations, and they, they suddenly realize they can't live without it. And when they, real, when they hear from commentators and scientists saying that climate change is going to affect the species that are all around us, and that we want to continue to be all around us, and that have already, there, there already are changes that have occurred, visible changes that have occurred in terms of the distribution of species in the Andes, and I'm sure it's happened in eastern Brazil as well. That then ties everything together. You can't do everything at once, and nobody can be an expert at everything. I've always been a proselytizer for become a real expert in something. Something, something that everyone will turn to you for for help in terms of solving it. And I've tended to do that with birds. I came along at a wonderful time when there really wasn't very much known about birds and I, I ended up finding a certain niche that uh, wouldn't make any sense now because all those bird, all those bird books are done. So <laughs> why do you have to do them all again? So, but, but they needed to be done desperately. Yeah. There was nothing then. And so that, that was what I ended up doing in a, in, a, in a broad synergistic way. And I think it was effective for that. If I was doing, entering the field now, I'm sure I'd end up being much more specialized. Why do you think conservationists are not more successful? Perhaps we talk to ourselves too much. I think the average scientist only, only connects with other scientists, with his own small, relatively small world. And many up and coming scientists are hyper focused on some rather small problem. They're encouraged to do that by their PhD committees. And so they tend not to take the broad view. And I think the way you become a great conservationist is to have a broader view. You obviously have to focus in on something beyond the broad view. But the broad view, the broad view gives you the perspective that things are not going well on this earth as far as species are concerned. Um, I've seen this everywhere. I remember in, when I was going through my education uh, at, at master's and PhD levels, at first I was strongly encouraged to focus in much more tightly on what I on my topics, and I eventually, just, I, I sort of rebelled against that. I said, look, I want to look at the broad perspective, and I think that has made a difference. I think, I think people, there, there's a need for people with that broad perspective. So what do you think we should do to change the present pattern in state of our world in conservation? One fantasizes about being a, a benign dictator and just straightening everything out and just making everything better. Unfortunately, that's not, it's not so simple, of course. Um, I think some of the trends are great. Um, there seems to be even less concern about the population issue, which is a, a, a very important one, I think. But there seems to be, that's, that's fundamental, that's core, that's ca that to a large extent that's what's causing climate change. And yet, the rise in the, in, in the numbers of people on the globe are, are still increasing, and they were going to continue to increase, but all indications are that, is, that, that, that the rate of increase is, is declining now, and that that decline in the rate of increase is going to continue in, in, in the on that same trajectory, such that population levels for the, on the globe may be relatively stable within 50 to 75 years, within, in, the, in the 21st century, which is, which is an amazing change. Things, things are shifting a little bit in a positive way. Just looking at things generally. I mean, I, it's really hard to not be very concerned about climate change. I, I am, but I'm figuring First of all, I am afraid I've contributed to it as, as an American citizen, uh, an American citizen who's flown in planes a lot. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm one of the fortunate ones, as Greta says. I'm one of the lucky ones. Uh, I've taken more than my share. I'm trying to pay back, but I'm still taking more than my share. More people need to think that way and need to think about how they are 
contributing to the problems in the world individually and more globally. I think the biota of the world deserves to live, deserves to survive, and I think it's absolutely irreprehensible what we as a species have done to our home uh, and making our home less uh, suitable for us as well as for all the wonderful myriad species of birds and animals and insects and everything else that are out there. Uh, I, f I find that repugnant that we've allowed that to happen. I find it amazing that more people are not concerned about it. Uh, I wish more people were. I like to think that there are more people now, but of course there are a lot of people who aren't. What do you think are the key actions to move species conservation forward? We need more data, inevitably. That's what everybody always says. You need more data, better data. We have the general idea of species distributions and densities, or uh, at least for most of the vertebrate fauna, uh, birds and the easy ones, birds and mammals and fish. Um, so from a conservation standpoint, it's probably pretty difficult to focus much on insects, to be absolutely honest. The number of species then is just, is, 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 it's, it's a couple of orders of magnitude greater than what we focus, tend to, what conservationists tend to focus on. I'd like to see more governments around the world recognize that this is that it's a that it, it it's a priority it's as much a matter of national pride as anything else that that we don't need these species we don't technically need them we will survive without a stressman's bristle front it's a brazilian treasure and to let it slip away as we almost have Hopefully it still survives, but there sure aren't many. It's a tragedy. It's a tragedy for the world, but most importantly, in this case, because it's, in, it's, a, it's found only in Brazil, only on a couple of mountain, mountain tops of Brazil. It's a tragedy then for Brazil. And I would love to see more and more people recognize all of these special entities out there as the treasures they are. How do you feel about the idea of triage in wildlife conservation? Triage means you sort of would then say, I mean, it's, it, it's a great idea in, in principle, but I don't want to write off anything. I would try to say, write off, to, to write off any species as in an impossible situation. It's difficult. I mean, admittedly, conservation dollars are finite, even limited, um, and that, which means you can't it's, it's really hard to throw significant effort, meaning funding, mm -hmm. at everything. It's what the United States has permitted to happen on the Hawaiian archipelago with the extinction of a number of bird species and other species in the last couple decades. And we've known about it, and we've still let it happen. And I think that is just, that's just ghastly. That's, triage would not, I, I would not write off any of the Hawaiian avifauna at this point, or the Hawaiian, or any of the Hawaiian plants that are in, in severe trouble. We as a country, and Hawaii as a state within the United States, should be doing far more to ensure that extinction, the extinction process does not proceed in Hawaii anywhere near the level it is, has, has recently, and it, 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 that's, that's the extraordinary thing, is that it's continued in recent times, in the last few decades, and since I've been alive. A whole bunch of species in Hawaii have gone extinct, most of them with our knowledge that they've gone extinct. Um, that's, that should not be allowed to happen. How would you explain the present sixth catastrophic event to the people of the 22nd century? That we're sorry. <laughs> it, 
it shouldn't be allowed to happen. I'd like to think we're going to stop it before it gets any worse. It is obviously happening before our very eyes, whether we like to admit it or not. Uh, in the case of the groups that I know best, there haven't been as many extinctions as I thought was going, were going to happen 50 or, 70, 50 or 60 years ago, but there have been some, and there certainly have been plenty of species that have become tremendously less numerous. Um, how do we explain it? Part of the problem, of course, is that we have much more of an impact on, uh, on, on natural habitats around the world. We have indirect effects of chemical contaminants around the world. We didn't know what we were doing. It's, and we're sorry, we're, we're doing our best. We cannot excuse it. It's awful. Previous extinctions were caused by the ones that were caused by people. They didn't know what they were doing. They didn't know. There wasn't adequate knowledge or communication in those days. Even the, the last pair of great auks uh, on the island off of, off of Iceland, they had no way of knowing that that was the last pair of great, great auks. Now we know. Now we know when the last little group of P.O. Piowalis, they brought the last two or three in, in in a desperate attempt to raise, to, to, to establish a captive population, it was too late. We knew, we knew it was going to be too late. I don't see that we, we need to do that. We know now what we need to do. And we just need to have, get, 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 put, get our act together and make sure that we don't allow species to decline to that level. Um, it, the successes are there. And we can point to that and recognize that we have it, when we put our mind to it, we've usually been able to turn things around. Um, and with the growing numbers of young people who actually are aware of this problem and have an interest in ensuring that the problem does not persist, I think we've got, I like to, I like to think we'll succeed that in the, what did you say, the 22nd century? 22nd century, yeah. Things will not be too much worse. They probably will. That's the sad reality. We're on, we're on paths that are going to be hard to reverse. Certainly climate change is one of those. Uh, but a lot of others, maybe not. I mean, the number of, as, as I've said about population in general, that's looking a little more hopeful uh, that, that Individ that the, the, the numbers of people in this uh, on the globe are going to stabilize at levels much lower than people were fearing was going to be the case 50, 25 or 50 years ago, the Paul Ehrlich side of things. And it, we're, that, that, that an increase in population doesn't necessarily need to result in total chaos and, to and, and widespread uh, difficulties, horrors on, on the globe for people as well as obviously for other species as well. So I, I'm hoping I'm talking ahead to people in 22, 20 or whatever it's going to be um, that, you know, we did what we could. We did make mistakes. We allowed it to get to, to deteriorate to a point far worse than I, than I, than I would have preferred. Uh, but I like to think that we've probably stemmed the tide and that in coming decades it's going to get, it's going to gradually get a little bit better with growing knowledge and the growing numbers of people who recognize the problem for what it is, the reality for what it is. What advice would you have for students who are seeking a career in international conservation? Uh, my first comment would have to be that you're lucky. Because when I was in university and then even in graduate school, there weren't many programs out there. It was hard to find the right program for me. I mean, it, when, I was, when I was at university, uh, a long time ago now, I mean, there was, the biology was all inside, inside lab laboratories. I mean, that's the way biology was. 
there was nothing in the field. There was very, very little. It was highly directed. Take advantage of what's out there. Uh, for Americans and Europeans, there are opportunities in the tropics. Tremendously more opportunities than there used to be. And I would have loved it if I had been able to do something like that. And there was, there was nothing like that right. now. Now there are programs around the world now that are attractive to students coming from Europe and Europe and America is what I'm thinking of here, but there also are plenty of opportunities for students in, in, in areas like Latin America to come study if they want to in European and, Amer and American universities. Uh, get out there and get some experience and then decide what you want to become really good at and focus on. You can't, you can't be an expert at everything for sure. You can know a little bit about a lot and um, learn some languages. For, for God's sakes, everyone in the Western Hemisphere should know some Spanish. Ideally, some Portuguese as well, <laughs> which I never did. But I got my, my Spanish is adequate. I didn't. I never took a course in Spanish, but I, le I learned it. And I, but I, I wished I've wished all along that I had taken sp courses in Spanish when I was in when I was in university. Good courses in Spanish, such as I could write good Spanish. I can't do that. It, that is awfully helpful now. Um, granted, I know there are all these wonderful programs on, on the internet that you can translate everything automatically, but it's still nothing like being able to do it yourself and, and, and to have that, uh, that cap capability of actually being fluent in Spanish and Portuguese as well as English. And if you're going elsewhere as Chinese or whatever it may be, uh, so that you are multilingual. One of the things I, that's disheartening in this country, U.S., is that so few people here in the U.S. are actually learning a foreign language. Um, they're actually not learning Spanish that much. And I think that's just that's terrible. Uh, it gives you a, a, a breadth that, that is incredibly useful in ongo ongoing life, um, whether you stay in academia or not. Um, you don't have to be you don't have to get a PhD. I think that's one of those things one has to remember is that to be a good conservationist, you don't really need an advanced degree. You ideally should, should get a university degree of some sort, I think, but that gives you, the back, again, some solid background. But you don't really need that to be a good conservationist. You want to certainly practice your public speaking so that you can be a good uh, proselytizer for what you're, for what you're doing. Most people in conservation now have to do that because they're chasing after money. They're, if they're either chasing after money if they're in private, with private groups, or they're, they're having to do that even, even at governmental level in, within governments because there's always competing needs for funding within governments. So you've got to be persuasive and learn how, learn how to present what you're doing in a positive and positive way. Uh, such that it's having an effect and is useful and that it's succeeding. Um, and then good luck. <laughs> <laughs> Overall, how do you feel reflecting back on your history with conservation? We did some pretty good work in Panama, but there's no question my work, my conservation work has been far and away more important in Ecuador than anywhere else. And there again, it's not pure luck, but the prepared person takes advantage of the luck that's presented to him or her. And I, I was lucky. I was incredibly lucky that I was presented with this unbelievable bird, the, what we ended up calling the Hokotoko Yantpeta, suddenly came in out of the forest and I recognized it as the new species, that it was an exciting, dramatically different new species of bird, quite large, relatively large bird, all things considered. And we quickly turned that into the conservation vehicle within the country of Ecuador to create a foundation, an organization, that now has 15, 15 private reserves scattered over most of the country, and that's had a, a profound effect in the country of Ecuador. And beyond that, it actually, the success of the Hokotoko idea actually then started to be rep has started to be replicated in a number of other countries. And it hasn't been quite so successful, maybe because they, other countries weren't as lucky to have a, Hoko, uh, to have a Hokotoko Ampeta 
was as this absolutely fabulous emblematic species and bird. But it, I do think we've had a, a dramatic effect within Ecuador now. That it, it, the changes there have been more profound, really quite profound at, on the societal level. And I guess I can look back and say, well, I, I played a very major role in that, and I'm very, very proud of that. Um, now it's up to the new generation to take over and carry on, and they are. That's also the good part, because mm. education works. Um, and we, both of us, started things that maybe don't need to be started again. Um, so to some extent, the glory maybe won't be there, but. I don't consider it glory. It was. It, I think it's just as just as wonderful to be able to carry on, and that's what that's what we need to do at Hokotoko. That's what we need to do at Save Brazil. So we need to do it all with all these different organizations. There's wonderful organizations in Singapore that I just visited. And they're 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 springing up everywhere. Private organizations in in support of conservation, typically birds. Admittedly, I've had a focus on, or at least an orientation towards birds all along. But God knows that this this approach seems to work for ever for everything. People picked it up, and there were, there are groups in Ecuador that now are focusing on rare and endangered frogs, and there's others that do focus on rare and endangered orchids, and it does it does work for other different groups. You just need to get the financial support and interest to keep it going. Uh, that requires education and then enthusiasm, and um, that those are out there. You just got to put them to work. Do you have any regrets? I've got a f couple of children. I wish I could have inspired one or the other of the three of them to get interested in this kind of thing. I will admit that's something I wish I could have done. I've to some extent sublimated that by being involved with educa informal educational activities as I've gone along. Mm -hmm. But I must say, I, I wish my son or either, either one of my two daughters would have really gravitated onto this. And they, they're all, they all love it, they all are very supportive, and in general they understand uh, what Robert's that or Papa's in my case, mm -hmm. uh, obsession is with birds and, and travel and, and conservation around the world. But they don't really get it, and they're not certainly following that path. And I, I wish that had happened. I do wish that had happened. I will say that. But I've been very lucky. I, you know, God, I don't, I don't have any. I don't have any regrets. I don't, really not. <laughs> I was, look, I wish I could live forever. I'll say that. Yeah. <laughs> I wish I, as my my friend Ed Willis, uh, Ed Wilson says. He says he's just turned ninety, and he he sort of calmly, plaintively says. Oh, I wish I was 80 again. <laughs> and I could say the same thing. Oh, I wish I was just 60 again. <laughs> so uh, you always wish you had more time, but I've been lucky again. I mean, I've, I've had good health. Mm. A few problems, of course, everybody does. But basically, I've had good health, and I've, and I've been able to take care of the family and do well. So your approach to conservation, has it changed through those 20 years? I think our approach has changed a little bit. I'm thinking now more specifically to Ecuador mm -hmm. uh, and the Hokotoko Foundation, where I have spent a great deal of time and effort keep getting it established, founding it, getting it established, getting it, making it successful for the first 15, no, 18 or 20 years, but now others are carrying on. Um, that we hadn't quite concentrated so much on bird bird watching tourism that i think that has that has proven not to be the panacea that i that i that i and a number of other a number of the rest of us thought that it would be that we'd be able to support what we're doing on the back of bird bird tourism um, we i guess we didn't understand the numbers uh, there weren't enough people interested in doing this we thought I mean, I just can't understand why somebody who came to Ecuador wouldn't just fall in love with it and want to come back and back and back over and over again the way I did, and, or even in Latin America. But in fact, for bird watchers, it's usually not that. Uh, they'll visit, <clears throat> they tend to visit different places once because they're after an experience that they're happy to have once, 
typically that's a life bird, and then they're on to another, another site, another experience, another life bird somewhere else. And that's not, the, that's not been a, it's not proven to be a good way to, to, to support conservation activities in situ. And we didn't realize that at the time. I, had, I did think that, that was going to work, that we were going to be able to change the world in the back of bird, tour, bird watching tourism. I'm, I'm less convinced that that's the case now, much less convinced. I think nature based is better. Uh, you, in, you try to push a, a broad based love for what you're seeing, for the whole environment, for everything there as opposed to individual rare bird species, some terannulate or whatever. I mean, you and I love to see a bahia terannulate, but you're always worrying about where is the, where is the financial support going to come from. And so I'm all, I will admit I've always been a bit of a hustler as far as that's concerned in, in my quiet way. I'm not out there shilling all the time, but, I, but inevitably you, you do the same thing, that we're, this is what you've got to do. We've had better success at Hokotoko and at Rainforest Trust now, more generally with the, with the, with the uh, general conservationists, so-called nature lovers, as opposed to the birders, the people who are particularly interested in seeing birds around the world. Or even, and there are others who are doing this, the monkeys, seeing monkey primates around the world. Uh, the the list-oriented individuals are not tending to be such great supporters of our of what we're trying to do. I think the biota of the world deserves to live, deserves to survive, and I think it's absolutely irreprehensible what we as a species have done to our home. Uh, and making our home less uh, suitable for us as well as for all the wonderful myriad species of birds and animals and insects and everything else that are out there. Uh, I, f I find that repugnant that we've allowed that to happen. I find it amazing that more people are not concerned about it. Uh, I wish more people were. I like to think that there are more people now, but of course there are a lot of people who aren't, and uh, that's part of our job as educators as well as conservationists, is to just try to get that message across and to encourage people to support what we in private organizations and what governments across around the world are trying to do. I sort of have the sense that every species has a right to survive. I think that's almost a God that's God given, that's part of creation. We, we owe it to the world to make everything survive. I mean, there's life and there's death, of course, but we want the species to, con to continue. I feel I've, I've, I've been very privileged that I've spent quite a bit of time with E.O. Wilson over the last few years, and that's been the message he's trying to get across so much, that it's all, creation is worthy of a fundamental core amount of support and recognition for what it is that we don't need this creation is there it's not there for us it's there because it's there and that's enough that's enough that's a, that's a good enough reason to try to try to make sure it, it continues